Welcome, you're listening to Jay's Analysis. If you've been listening recently, we've had a few theologians on. We've talked about different topics relating to Eastern and Western theology with some priests. This time I have a fellow young chap like myself who is making his way through all of these disparate topics. I have with me Tommy Seraphim Hamilton. Tommy, how are you? I'm working very well. Very well, thank you. Yeah, and you have a blog that uh, I thought there was a really good piece that you sent to me that is titled Why I Became a Creationist. Why don't you tell people what your blog is first? Uh, my blog is cabane 52 dot tumblr dot com and that's a b a n e five two okay and why this what 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 why did you want to talk about creation that's such a, a funny topic because it's so against the norm you know what i mean it's like it's like one, one thing i've noticed is i got more and more into this topic like you did is that it's almost like any position is cool as long as it's not this one <laughs> do, well, do you know what i mean Absolutely. And, you know, I've been reading lately um, various books about alternative science, like parapsychology and stuff like that. And what I've noticed is that the authors in these books, they're obviously on the fringe, but in each of these books, at least once, they have ritually denounced creationism mm -hmm. or intelligent design. And that's essentially the virtue signaling in science. That's the way someone on the fringe of science can still say, well, I'm in line with the standard world yes view. that's a great point yeah, yeah even, even in the fringe you kind of have to do obeisance to the existing dogmas of the scientific establishment and scientism yeah. is you know something that we deal with a lot at my side i've written i don't know how many articles critiquing scientism so i thought it was great what you did with your piece and your piece that came to my attention is why i became a creationist and i love that you titled it like it was almost kind of another conversion why you yeah. want to explain that a little bit yeah, conversion is a great way of putting it because I've got kind of a weird history with this topic. Um, I was raised in evangelical, so I was a young earther. Um, but then at 13, uh, we started going to uh, a conservative evangelical church, but where a lot of people were intellectuals and involved in serious books. And so we had a science in the Bible class, and I was interested in the topic, so I went. And several of the speakers at this class promoted theistic evolution. Uh, so I became interested in the topic uh, at 13, uh, and I became an ardent Darwinist. Uh, I wanted to be an evolutionary biologist. Uh, I made over 300 videos on YouTube about this subject, critiquing <laughs> creationists. Uh, eventually, I nearly became an atheist, but uh, I, came, I came back to Christianity and got into apologetics. Mm -hmm. um, but while I was in apologetics, and even while I was a Christian and I, I converted to orthodoxy along the way, there was always the nagging sense of doubt. Because Darwinism tells us that what everybody thought was the most powerful reason for believing that there was a designer, an architect, a musician of the universe, Darwinism tells us that we don't actually need that. Right. It tells us that the argument Paul makes in Romans 1 is invalid. And it just seems like it fits very well with naturalism. Mm -hmm. And so I went through uh, periodic crises of faith. Uh, when I looked out at the world, when I looked at trees, they, yes, they were beautiful, but I felt like this beauty had to be constantly qualified. Uh, when I read the Bible, uh, I had a reduced view of it because if, uh, if Genesis 1 to 11 is not historical, then the whole world picture yeah. that the Bible inhabits. Uh, is off to some degree. Genesis 1 to 11 are not just like any other section of the Bible. Uh, every later biblical author depends on these, not just in terms of the ideas, but in terms of the illusions that they make, in terms of their view of man. Right. And what, what's, what most people don't think about is that if we believe the standard evolutionary account of the origins of the world, the origins of man, um, this has pretty profound implications for how we see human nature. So yes. sit, what Christians understand as the effects of sin, of original sin, these temptations are actually inherent to who we are, they're evolutionary adaptations. Uh, you have to believe that for 200,000 years, man was uh, a hunter-gatherer, that he just wandered for 200,000 years, and that what that means is that man is not fundamentally a cultural city-building creature. 
uh, you have to believe that the similarities between biblical and Near Eastern religion are the result of borrowing on the part of the biblical authors. Mm -hmm. And so you find um, in evangelical scholarship uh, this understanding that the rituals of Leviticus and the structure of the tabernacle and temple are actually a polemic against paganism. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you take the historicity of Genesis 1 to 11 seriously, then what you realize is that all of this is wrong. Man was monotheistic first. He started out uh, worshiping the true God. God taught him in Genesis chapter 4 how to offer sacrifices. God taught him how to build temples. Uh, and the passions, the temptations that we experience are in fact not inherent to who we are. They're not encoded in us. Yeah. Uh, instead, the, that's a corruption. This a, that's, a, that's a great point because I was going to actually mention, I got in my notes that uh, you, what what a lot of people who approach this don't understand is that there's kind of a golden chain of redemption, you know, that that connects the eschatology and the soteriology and the idea that we might have of the resurrection with all of what we see in Genesis in terms of its anthropology and its creatology. Yeah. And the two really hang together because, for example, I mean, this is not directly related, but just take, for example, the way Paul speaks in Romans 4 about... Uh, that justification is likened to the miracle of uh, the resurrection uh, or of the birth uh, in Sarah's womb. Yeah. It's the ability of God to create out of nothing. And um, I actually, I was reading recently William Lane Craig. I'm not a huge fan of William Lane Craig. I have a lot of criticisms, but his recent book on creation ex nihilo was really good because he was actually hammering home this point about the fact that you can't really do a piecemeal theology where you want to say, well, I like the idea of some historicity as it relates to the synoptic gospels, but I don't want to really want to deal with the possibility of any historicity when we get back to Babel and Noah, you know what I mean? Yeah, and I mean, this is the thing. Um, I mean, first, I, I called it a conversion because when I became a creationist and I internalized it, everything was different. Yeah, for me too. I'm not, yeah. I'm, and I'm not saying that theistic evolutionists are uh, heretics or apostates or anything like that. I think it's dangerous, but I was mm -hmm. a theistic evolutionist and God still worked with me. But when I became a creationist, I went outside and I realized the world really is beautiful. I mean, these things are not just random evolutionary adaptations which God just decided to work with. Everything testifies loudly to the glory of God. And I realized just how far astray the naturalistic um, contemporary worldview had went. Yeah. I mean, you have to believe, if you're a, a, a theistic evolutionist and a traditional Christian, you have to believe that naturalism and atheism are profoundly, deeply, seriously wrong, that they're a delusion, but you also have to believe that naturalists have discovered the truth about the origin of the world, yeah. and we didn't really have it. And those things intuitively they don't really go together. Amen. That's a great sense, point. Yeah. You can sense something is wrong. Yeah, it makes me think of the fact that when, well, just in my in my own experience, I was for a long time. No, I didn't want to commit to any of these positions just because I, I remained agnostic on it. I read the Bible through many times as a Protestant and then as a Roman Catholic before getting really interested in Orthodoxy, and I I tended to lean towards. Genesis being historical, not because I was really steeped in any science. I didn't really get into philosophy of science or anything like that until college and grad school. But I started realizing that, well, you know what? When you read the New Testament, you can constantly see allusions to and references to, and for example, the way Jesus talks about Adam and Eve, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you can see that how the apostolic perspective is. And then, of course, when you branch out into, you know, reading the church fathers, East and West, you start to see that at least for the dominant majority, the tendency is to read it as did, you know, Judaism of that period, for the most part, uh, read it as historical. And uh, we, I think we should just really quick make uh, maybe a little caveat that I, I know you would agree with, but for the sake of listeners, because this, this, I think tends to cause a lot of confusion is that people will say, Oh, uh, do you do you read these texts as literal or do you believe in symbolism in the Bible? And really, this is a basic kind of uh, 
hermeneutical, which is the science of interpretation. This is a basic hermeneutical confusion because we don't have to have a dialectic in interpreting scripture between something being on the one hand literal and then on the other hand something being figurative. So, for example, right. you know, when Paul in Galatians talks about the allegory of Mount Sinai and, and uh, the Jerusalem that is above in heaven, that's all based on the presupposition or the assumption that the events with Abraham were historical. And yeah. so the symbolism, generally speaking, not always, sometimes there's there's purely, I guess you could say, mystical or anagogical symbolism that's or whatever, allegorical. But, but, but most of the time, the symbolism is built on the historicity. So, for example, you mentioned in your piece, you know, the, the idea of the tabernacle, the temple kind of being an image of the, the entire cosmos and God's dwelling place as a, yeah. as a kind of microcosm. Well, that's based on the idea if you know, if you read Hebrews, it's based on the fact that there was an actual temple right, that, yeah. oh, that exactly. stood, right? And that was, you know, torn down and so forth. So that's an important uh, false dialectic that people get into where they think, oh, I don't read the Bible, you know, literally. I believe in it symbolic. Oh, you believe in it. Well, actually, that's it's more nuanced than that because there's there's different senses to these things. And, and I think it's very important what you said that the historical uh, the historical sense and I like saying historical sense rather than literal sense because there are some texts which have a historical sense that are not literal that's a great sense, point yeah. like Isaiah 13 mm -hmm. but uh, the really important point is that it's not just that the historical sense and the allegorical or symbolic sense are compatible or that we believe both in once it's actually that the symbolic sense requires the historical sense because yeah. when we ask about biblical symbolism uh, what is biblical symbolism trying to tell us what it's trying to tell us is that God made the real concrete world which we live in every day as a symbolic universe right it's truly and really symbolic of Christ and it's the same with typology mm -hmm. uh, which is historical symbolism uh, typology in scripture uh, is requires historicity for us to actually grasp its meaning because what it tells us is that history isn't random history is actually ordered by God and if this symbolism and this typology is just literary and it's not um, concrete uh, what that means is that well what we have is we have symbolism in a book but we don't actually learn anything about the real world that yeah. God made from that symbolism right we would be basically back at the idea of the Greek myths which are uh, you know, taking place in some ancient, far off golden age that really are ahistorical. And that was kind of the, I read a great essay a few years ago from a, a scholar who was kind of back, uh, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 years ago, kind of going against that trend that was popular around the turn of the, of the last century. Where the idea was, oh, Christianity is just kind of this uh, hodgepodge of Neoplatonism. And uh, the guy who wrote the piece, I, I can pull it out. I don't have to remember who wrote it off the top of my head. But he was basically contrasting. He was saying, he was saying oh, actually, there's a lot in Christianity that's radically different from uh, both uh, the Mithra cult and uh, Neoplatonism. And I'm going to show you how. And he says, look, this is a religion that's based on the idea of the entrance of God into history. That is totally foreign to the Greek idea or to ne or Platonism or Neoplatonism. That's not how it works. Yeah. And so, yeah, so to radically divorce God from creation, which is really what we've seen, I think, in the West, especially post-Darwin, which Darwinism, in my view, is really kind of an outworking of this this longer train of ideology oh, yeah. uh, from the Middle Ages and nominalism and positivism and so forth and empiricism that leads us down this deistic track that the West took. Uh, yeah. But we can trace these things back. But another great point that we need to make, too, you mentioned evangelicals who kind of uh, debate over how to deal with Genesis is that when you understand the origins of the questioning of this, it also is a big aid, I think, in understanding how it's really built on a bunch of flimsy nonsense. So, for example, when you look at Julius Wellhausen, who's the father of what's called uh, the documentary hypothesis, the idea that the, the early texts were composed by these uh, different schools of the Yahwist, the Elohist, the Priestly, and the Deuteronomist, and so forth. Yeah. What you start to see is that Wellhausen himself admittedly said that he had an agenda. He was interested, he said, in co totally destroying this ridiculous mosaic religion, which he viewed 
as just this bizarre kind of Jewish uh, obsession with ritualism and so forth. So he yeah. had an agenda, and it wasn't this neutral, uh, you know, uh, academic free thought exercise where he was going to, you know, really try to parse out the text and so forth. No, there was an agenda behind it. And then, of course, this totally blossoms into the nuclear destruction of the Jesus Quest and all of that stuff. Yeah. Uh, it's, and, you know, yeah, go ahead. You know, related to that, um, I want to make a point about the way that evolution and Darwinism um, came to be the scientific consensus. Because you hear a lot of people say, well, it's a scientific consensus, I trust the scientists, why would they all be convinced of this uh, unless there was some good evidence for it? And the history that most people think happened is that Darwin published his Origin of Species in 1859, and then there was a gradual positive onslaught of evidence, which eventually convinced the scientific community. Um, but that's not really true. No, I mean, not at all. Was, it was within 10, 15 years that everybody uh, was an evolutionist. Uh, and Darwin himself, I like Darwin, I think Darwin was a great scientist, but Darwin himself in the origin, um, he had in the original edition um, passages mentioning the skepticism of other scientists, such as Richard Owen, to his theory. And within 15 years, that skepticism was almost totally gone, and those other scientists actually tried to get Darwin to uh, remove those passages, to scrub the record, mm -hmm. as it were. And Darwin, to his credit, refused. Um, but, you know, this was... Darwin's theory was accepted not because of a positive onslaught of evidence, but because it cohered very, very well with an ideology and a view of the world that was becoming increasingly popular. Yeah, and another point that I often make in talks that I do, in discussions that I do, and believe it or not, uh, this may seem strange to you, but I think a lot of the people in the audience and a lot of the people that I talk to and have on the show, we discuss this, is the possibility of there actually being a different a different explanation for what happened in the West in the last four or 500 years. Mm -hmm. And one of those would be, if you look at the Royal Society and who was behind it and what it was interested in promoting, and you start to see that that really meshes well with the mythology of Darwinism. So yeah. if, you know, I think we're all probably aware of the original title that it dealt with the idea of uh, the favored races of the Anglosphere. And so th that period of uh, Victorian England, right, the height of the British Empire, was very interested in not just uh, propaganda, but a kind of scientific mythology, right, that would go along with the mythos of the empire. And what fit the bill perfectly was what Darwin presented, because it's all about the idea that that the Anglo-Saxon Empire, which is embodied in persons like Cecil Rhodes, Cecil Rhodes, excuse me, who explicitly wrote about the desire to create a royal society that would that would basically control academia in the West and promote the interests of the British Empire, which is there's no doubt that this is an, a Freemasonic empire. That when you see this pushed out into the world, it's all done by the Royal Society now. Interestingly, Masons will actually write books that talk about this openly. There's a famous Mason named Robert Lomas who wrote a book called Freemasonry in the History of the Royal Society. And what he does is he talks about how all of what we understand to be modern science is crafted <laughs> crafted to uh, reflect the philosophy and, well, anti-theology of the Royal Society for the last three or 400 years. And Darwinism is one of the key pillars in that propaganda um uh, push of the empire. It's also, yeah. Also, if you look at the history of some of the, uh, not necessarily Darwin, but the other people in his circles, like Herbert Spencer, Ernst Haeckel, you will find them uh, also having a, an intense interest in Freemasonry. And I'm not even interested in the conspiratorial aspect of Freemasonry, but rather the ideological underpinnings of this philosophy. And it is a kind of pseudo-religious philosophy that is deistic. And so that's why these guys really like this naturalistic philosophy is because it meshes well with the deism that they're all blabbing about in their lodges over their, you know, uh, cigars or whatever. Uh, and so it fits well with the, the, the ethos of the British Empire. And I've, I've done a lot of research into the history of Br British intelligence, which comes out of these same networks and what they would do to to 
basically push the ideology of that empire. Uh, now, of course, we don't live in the era of the British Empire nowadays. It's more the American Empire. But that is very important to understand because just like Wellhausen, you start to see that uh, attacks on traditional views, right? Attacks on the idea of God as creator or attacks on the idea of the Gospels as historical or genesis. They, they don't come out of a vacuum. They come out of different networks or power blocks that have an invested interest in seeing the history of the West or, or, or uh, our society, our civilization go a certain way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and let me just say something um, about Darwin personally, um, because a lot of creationists have some kind of personal animus towards Darwin himself, but my own view is that um, Darwin was a very careful, reflective um, thinker who was capable of thinking philosophically. The real culprits of what we know as Darwinism are people like Huxley. Uh -huh. uh, and they're his successors. Uh, Darwin, if you read his letters, Darwin became, uh, Darwin was still thinking about, and he had a lot of questions uh, about his theory. I wouldn't go so far to say that he seriously considered giving it up, but there were things that made him doubt. Um, and it's others uh, who primarily were the architects of dogmatic mm -hmm. yeah. Darwinism. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I've read, uh, I think B.B. Warfield has a big, long, uh, kind of a, almost a small book that he wrote on Darwin, or maybe a really lengthy essay that I read several years ago. And he kind of takes that track where he says, look, this can still be reconciled with uh, with theology. Look at Darwin's own life. He, he didn't really question a theism until the very very end at least if i remember correct i read that like 15 yeah. years ago but that's what bb warfield argued and that's how he thought you know he could reconcile theistic evolution with uh, his calvinism but um yeah i think that you know you can always go in a different direction with the different thinkers that you pick but there's no question that after darwin and into the uh, real movers and shakers in the royal society and the uh the Fabian Socialists uh, and Bertrand Russell and these different successors that, to to that school of thought that you're talking about, these you know reductionist materialists that really uh, promote this view. Yeah. Um, and H.G. Wells, he's very important in that too. Uh, these are all guys that I, I discuss quite frequently, um, and that's where we get you know this really becoming everywhere. Uh, I are actually, I actually argue that it's not so much, I mean, a lot of it is obviously through academia, but it's also everywhere in pop culture, uh, especially yeah. from the time of, say, when H.G. Wells writes The Time Machine, that is all based on the idea of these vast aeons and uh, Darwinism. It's all about how, well, a billion, billion years from now, right, this is what the human race is going to evolve into the Eloi and the Morlocks, uh, and that's all fiction. <laughs> it has no basis in anything in history but that's something that probably millions more people will read than will learn from some professor in some room and so anyway i'm just making the point that that's why i um you know talk about fiction a lot and i don't want to blab too long here but let's get into more of your actual article so you talk about the different theories and how you kind of went through different you know, consideration periods of, you know, well, maybe it was the framework hypothesis, maybe it was the days of cons uh, consecration, maybe it was a day-age theory. What were the things that maybe kind of really solidified it for you? Well, um, my first view is, a uh, my first view when I became a, a Darwinist uh, was a pretty standard one in um, kind of archaic uh theistic evolutionary circles. It's not held so much anymore, but it's the day-age view that uh, each of the creation days is actually a symbol for a long period of time. Now, I'm amazed, and I don't mean to be too condescending, but I'm amazed when people hold this view for more than um, three, three or four months, because <laughs> when you go to the text, uh, it is so abundantly clear that this just does not work. And if you read the arguments for the day-age view, I mean, they just get bizarre and arbitrary with the text. I mean, uh, first of all, the order of events in the creation week clearly does not follow out the right. order of events in the conventional history of the world. Um, uh, the sun is created on the fourth day, whereas obviously in the conventional view, the sun precedes the earth. Uh, the stars 
are created in the fourth day together with the sun on the conventional view of the stars long precede the earth. And so what advocates of the day age view argue is that, well, actually, uh, the fourth day does not refer to the creation of the sun, moon, and stars. Instead, it refers to the dissipation of a cloud cover, which had uh, before covered the earth and made these heavenly lights invisible. Now, that's not what the text says. Um, nobody ever thought the text said that mm -hmm. because that's not what it says. It says he created these things uh, on day four and the same word is used for God's creation of, uh, of animals. So clearly that's wrong and so I abandoned that pretty quickly. Uh, the next view most people don't know about but I, I read a guy named uh, Glenn Morton who's a theistic evolutionist. He uh, worked in the oil industry as a former young earth creationist and he held a view called Days of Proclamation. Uh, and Days of Proclamation is essentially the idea that the creation week is literal uh, because in seven 24 hours, God proclaimed seven orders. And so God proclaimed his intent to create such and such and such and such and such and such. So this avoids all the problems with trying to prove that these are not 24 hour days. It avoids all the problems with uh, the discrepancy in the ordering between the biblical order and the conventional history. Uh, the problem is that it's very, very hard to see how anybody could derive that from the text. Mm -hmm. um, because, number one, uh, if God issued these proclamations to create at the beginning of time, before anything was made, then why is it marked by evening and morning? Number one, we're told that the sun... Uh, was created to fit the day. In other words, the time scale was already established. The sun was created to fit that. Uh, why would 24 hours be meaningful at all before there was a sun, moon, and stars on the days of proclamation view? Uh -huh. uh, the second problem is that uh, Exodus 20 says that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh, right. not merely that he proclaimed his intent to create. Right. And, the third, right. Yeah. and the third view is that the whole days of proclamation argument essentially depends on uh, noting the lack of a very explicit statement that the creation of these things immediately follows God's proclamation to create. But there's no way to actually derive such a gap from the text. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you want to take the Bible seriously, um, you can't just mold the text in that way to fit your view. And so the Days of Proclamation view, I think, um, relative to the Day Age view, it's respectable, but you just can't derive it from the text. And so um, I abandoned that view uh, within a few years, and I was kind of floating around. I really didn't think about it that much. I was more into <coughs> other stuff, like orthodoxy. Uh -huh. um, but uh, then a book came out by John Walton He's an evangelical biblical scholar who teaches at Wheaton. Uh, uh, and the book was called The Lost World of Genesis 1. And essentially, the argument of the book was that when we study Genesis 1 in its ancient Near Eastern context, uh, we are not actually, we realize that ancient Near Eastern creation stories are not actually focused on the creation of the material world. And that includes Genesis for Walton. He says, instead, <laughs> This is the consecration of the world. God is setting it up and ordering it to function as a temple. Uh, and Walton thus interprets the word create to be something like when a person creates a corporation, right? So the material for the buildings is already, esta already established. All the material stuff is there, but the corporation is created when these buildings are actually set up to function mm -hmm. in an ordered fashion uh, in order to create uh, this ordered system. Now, this view has become very popular, I think, um, because people sense that you can argue this in a way that's not arbitrary, right? So you can make an argument for this that does not, and you can make an argument that this is actually how the original um, readers might have heard it. Uh, and so a lot of people really like this. They perceive it as a way out um, of what the text in my view clearly says. Now, the, the difficulty with this um, is first of all, uh, when you read the text, it really, when you just read it, it sounds very, very strange to say that this is uh, 
just a conceptual creation or a functional creation. You know, when God says, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, it seems to be that those living creatures had not been swarming before. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see how exactly God was just setting it up to function with respect to the creation's existence as a temple. Uh, and then the bigger problem, in my view, is that the creation week in Scripture forms a literary device. It's a pattern which later biblical authors will draw on. So, for example, the seven night visions of Zechariah, if you map those out according to the creation week, you find they correspond very tightly. Uh, it's a literary device. And uh, one of the most clear examples of this pattern is in Exodus 25 to 31. Uh, this is where God dictates the instructions for the tabernacle to Moses. And it's dictated in seven speeches. The Lord said to Moses, is repeated seven times. And yeah. you look at, uh, at the information contained in these seven speeches, you find it maps on very, very nicely to the creation week. For example, the fourth speech uh, dictates the creation of the lampstand, uh, which is which corresponds clearly to the heavenly lights. The sixth day is when God fills Bezalel with the spirit of God, which corresponds to the creation of Adam, and when God breathed the spirit of life. Right. Into. Well, I, I was actually going to say that when you look at the 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 Torah and the prophets, when the way that they speak of the actual week and the way that the Jewish calendar functioned, it's all based on the principle of the seven day week in Genesis. Yeah, I mean, it's and, it's, it's you know, the the whole idea of the Sabbath is based on that. Yeah, and and I mean, it's dictated in seven speeches here because the tabernacle is the microcosm of the world. Right. And the big problem for Walton's view in Exodus twenty five to thirty one is that the creation of the tabernacle here includes and incorporates the organization of the actual material. So this is not just the tabernacle is already built; Moses is consecrating it. We're actually given an account in Leviticus of that consecration. Right. Right. But the consecration is not what's described in Exodus 25 to 31. Uh, it, it's describing the material construction of the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's true in Kings with the temple as well, where the temple is built in seven years, mm -hmm. uh, obviously corresponding mm -hmm. to the creation week. The temple was a miniature creation. Uh, the consecration of that temple takes place at the uh, end of that period. But the seven is actually associated with the material organization uh, of the tabernacle and the temple. Mm -hmm. uh, the Waltons view also creates theological problems because when John says all things were made through Christ, are we speaking, if, if one wants to say that made in this text refers to the functional organization of already existing material order into uh, a temple, then actually what you're saying is that, if you take this consistently, what you're saying is that the relationship of the Logos to the world uh, is actually the imposition of meaning on things which did not already bear that meaning, mm -hmm. uh, which is very, very problematic because then you say that the actual structure of material mm -hmm. objects is does not inherently bear a theological meaning. And so that pretty much... Um, destroyed those considerations uh, destroyed my commitment to Walton's view and I found personally that other people tend to go through the same process they're initially very hopeful very enthusiastic and then they realize the huge problems and abandon it um, the final view I held is somewhat related to that it's called the framework view and the framework view uh, notes the literary structure of Genesis 1, that on the first three days you have the creation of three zones, and on the second three days you've got the creation of three uh, sets of living objects or stars to fill those zones. And then it says uh, that, well, because of this literary structure, what we actually are to perceive is that there's a literary framework uh, here, and that therefore the text was not intended to be historical. Uh, and then it tries to note some apparent contradictions between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 to 3 and says that these were actually intended as clues to show us Genesis 1 wasn't to be taken historically. The contradictions are very weak and I just call this biblical criticism light because it uses the same arguments as proponents of the documentary hypothesis but it says that Moses put them in there in order to clue us in and apparently not that many people got the message throughout history. Uh, the problem, the big problem with the framework view 
is that it's based on a non sequitur. Uh, as we discussed earlier, there is absolutely nothing in biblical symbolism, typology, or a literary framework that uh, in any way implies it's not historical. I mean, God created a beautiful and orderly world, uh, and you can full well write legitimate history inside a literary framework. Uh, and what really took this view out for me um, was when I read an article by James Jordan, who's not well known, but I think he's a, I mean, a truly insightful biblical commentator. He talks about biblical symbolism, and, and Jordan compared the framework view to something in John 20. Uh, and in John 20, uh, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb of Jesus, uh -huh. and she looks inside the tomb, and she sees two angels on either side of Jesus's tombstone. And uh, John's gospel has a huge temple theme. Jesus is the high priest of the temple. Uh -huh. It's also Yahweh, and what that passage in John 20 is telling us is that the whole the uh, tomb of Jesus is like the Holy of Holies, which right. have two angels on either side of the throne of God. But none of that means it's not historical. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody, including proponents of the framework hypothesis, would use that to say that John 20 is not describing a historical event. Um, and that, that shows that this very inconsistent method of interpretation that's being applied there to, to Genesis 1. So those are, those are the views I held, and that's basically why I abandoned them. Now, you moved to the flood, and I, that was uh, really good explanations there. I totally agree, and I, I've learned a lot from James Jordan myself over the years. I remember paying him $300 to get a, a big box that he <laughs> sent me of all of his papers and stuff, and uh, I don't think he sent a thank you note, but I was one of the <laughs> I was one of the few people that actually paid a three hundred dollar thing for all of his stuff. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, yeah. So <clears throat> you next you moved to the flood, and I the weird thing about my situation with the flood was that when I was at I did Bible college for a while, and I had some ancient Near Eastern classes, and I had a Genesis class and a <clears throat> natural science class. And of course, all the professors I had were anything but, uh, you know, the idea of creation. They were, I think, day age theory was the the most prevalent there where I attended. But when we actually got into, you know, the Onuma Elish and these different ancient Near Eastern documents, it seemed to me like they were all saying that there was a flood. So it, it was natural for me to tend to defend the idea of, um, you know, a global flood, not just merely a local flood. Yeah. Um, I know that, that there might be some debate over that, but uh, what's your take on the flood? I know you deal with it in your article. Well, um, the first thing I just want to say about this is that a lot of people who are Darwinists or old age creationists um, think that if they can explain Genesis 1, then, well, they're home free. But I say with complete confidence, even if Genesis 1 did not exist, I would still be a young age creationist, um, in part because of the flood. Uh, now, Genesis 6 to 8 uh, clearly uh, says that there was a global flood. There are some people who want to argue it's a local flood, uh, but frankly, I asked a person once if God or Moses had wanted to communicate the idea of a global flood, what could he have said other than what is said in Genesis 6 to 8? And my interlocutor said, well, there actually is no conceptual way he could have communicated that because it says all everything under the whole heaven was covered. It says that all the high mountains were covered. It says that all things in which the breath of life was died. Uh, and importantly, Genesis 6 to 8 is actually structured as a, or Genesis 7 rather, is structured as a reverse creation week. So the idea here is that the world, the entire world, which was made in Genesis 1, that world is flooded. Uh, yeah, it's a Genesis it's a new seven. a new creation. Yeah, exactly, and that correspondence depends on the universality. Yeah. of Genesis. 4. It also reminds me of the, the the kind of argumentation that is the flawed argumentation that's used in the the way William Lane Craig argues for ex nihilo creation, because you'll have people that will say. Oh well, uh, everything under heaven and earth—you uh, know, God creating everything in the heavens and the earth—that's not 
really a statement about everything because there was eternal matter, right? So God is just kind of the architect who forms uh, things out of the eternally existing matter, you know, which is basically what Aristotle or even Freemasonry says, right? The great architect of the universe. Uh, but no, actually, it's pretty consistent throughout numerous texts that, especially in, if you look at Hebrews, you know, the way that all things come into existence, or Colossians 1 with the Logos, right? All things come together and are held together and are created by, for, and through him. So yeah. it, it's it's very similar to the way that we've got to try to play with the language and do a little bit of eisegesis to say, well, it's not really about that. When, I mean, even when you start digging into the scientific data, and you will find even people in the mainstream that will try to deal with this, where you've got these weird piles of fossils and uh, like trees extending through the different layer of strata that don't make sense, right? This this layer is supposed to be 100 billion years old. This layer is 200 billion, but you've got a tree like stuck all the way up through the middle of them. So, I mean, the one thing I want to say about the flood is that people um, people sometimes ask me, well. Okay, I find your argument for global flood biblically convincing, but why can't I hold an old Earth evolution and a global flood? And my response to that is basically, well, conceptually, you could. There's no logical contradiction there, but it doesn't make any sense because if you're an old ager, then presumably you're an old ager because of the evidence in the rocks. You believe that the rocks required millions of years to be laid down and that the fossil record is a record of things that lived millions and billions of years ago. Um, now, if you hold that, then you hold the conventional interpretation of the strata, but you also hold a global flood, then you need to find some evidence for the flood within that conventional framework. I mean, it's, if it's a global flood, this is a massive upheaval, um, it undoubtedly would have lacked some geological evidence. There's no evidence within the conventional framework for a global flood. There's no universal layer of flood sediment. And so if the flood happened, the only other option is that the evidence for the flood is the geologic column itself. In other words, the conventional interpretation of these rocks must be wrong. Yes, uh, and, exactly. And if, and if the conventional interpretation is wrong, well, then your very justification for holding for to an ancient earth is gone. Yeah, I in my article, when I dealt with some of that, I... I came across some really cool stuff that like two years ago I had no idea of this and it just completely blew me away now I, I don't tend to because of I'm a more of a presuppositionalist I wouldn't base everything on this or that specific piece of data uh, uh, evidentially speaking but I do think evidences are absolutely crucial within you know a framework or a paradigm and so I started talking about in my piece the fly geyser which is at Burning Man if you know about where all the hippies go to party out in the desert there's this giant geyser that according to mainstream science should take 190,000 years to form this geyser is 60 years old <laughs> it's a man-made accidental creation that is this giant rainbow colored because there's a bunch of calcite on it that's grown up in the last 60 years and that's public uh, information there are uh, of course uh, other examples that you give like this that they have found B-17 B bombers that are under 250 layers of ice, or excuse me, 250 feet of ice, but 250 feet of ice is supposed to be dated at, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. So a lot of this, you start realizing, wait a minute, they just make this stuff up because it's all based on a presupposition that runs through academia like a meme or a virus that everybody thinks you have to start with that assumption and, as, and until you question that assumption you're always going to be running on a faulty program at least that's the, the take i have well, let me say something about uh, the evidence here because um i don't want to make it seem like there's there are no difficulties with the young age young age model or that there's just no reason whatsoever scientifically to hold to an ancient earth because there are things that um, are difficulties for a young age model um there is evidence for an old earth, but there's evidence for lots of false things. Um, but I think the broader point here um, is that as we look at the world and we observe it, um, many of these problems for a young earth have been solved simply by uh, events that, it, one, of, one of the big examples is the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Mm -hmm. uh, 
which was a huge catastrophe. Uh, and the eruption of Mount St. Helens um, created a number of features which we also see in the geological record and which have been used as evidence for an ancient earth. Uh, one of my favorite examples is fossil forest. Now fossil forest, uh, it has trees in upright position, several layers of these trees laid on top of each other. Mm -hmm. And the conventional explanation for, uh, for, for these fossil forests is that you had a whole forest that was then fossilized and then the forest grew back and another forest was fossilized on top of that. So you have the upright um, sequence of the trees. And creationists before the eruption of Mount St. Helens simply had no way of explaining that. It really did look like the conventional interpretation was the only way. But when Mount St. Helens erupted, it destroyed enormous amounts of trees. Uh, and it, those trees were floating in a lake near Mount St. Helens. Now, when geologists went and studied these trees, they found that these trees were standing upright on top of each other, just mm -hmm. as we find them in the geological record. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Mount St. Helens also, it carved a miniature canyon, which has very, very similar properties to the Grand Canyon. Uh, and so... Yeah. I was actually I was actually going to bring up the gash in the Bighorn Mountains in Wyoming. This happened uh, October of last year. A giant, it looks like the Grand Canyon, just yeah, op opened yeah. up with overnight. Uh, yeah. Was that supposed to take 100 million years, though? Yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, um, if you want to get into the scientific evidence, we can we can do that. Or well, it just popped up. I mean, I, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, the 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 thing with the science is that there are. Um, I, I distinguish kind of three levels of scientific issues. Um, the first level is that of an ancient earth. Um, there are some good arguments for an ancient earth. There are some real problems with a young age model. However, there has, uh, there are almost no young age scientists, uh, but the young age community since the early 1990s, when it actually got to work on model building and not just refuting the opposition, but model building, they have made with almost no funding, enormous progress in understanding the geologic record. Um, the RATE project, which dealt with radiometric dating, uh, had some incredible findings. Uh, Kurt Wise, who's a Harvard trained paleontologist, he had some incredible ideas of, uh, about the fossil record, which have made predictions which have been confirmed. So there are real problems, yes, but there are also some very good reasons for holding the young earth. Uh, then there's the issue of evolution, understood as common descent. Um, Evolution understood as common descent, it's just that all life shares a common ancestor. And that's not equivalent to Darwinism, which is about the mechanism of evolution, which is natural selection. Mm -hmm. And common descent, uh, there are some um, good pieces of evidence for it. There are some things which look like all life is, gen is descended from a common ancestor. Um, I think that, especially over the last 15 years, uh, there have been, there's been a lot of evidence coming in which gives an alternative uh, explanation for this, and maybe we can get into that later, but but that's what I've found, and there are also increasing problems with common descent. For example, mm -hmm. uh, it's been demonstrated that biological similarity, a lot of the time homology, um, homologous organs and anatomical features are often uh, generated by different genes, and they take different developmental pathways yeah. during, um, during pregnancy. Uh, that's a huge problem. For, for, for well, DNA you know. itself is a massive problem. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm aware of what you're talking about, but the, the fact that there's no new information that's ever uh, printed in any specific code is pretty yeah. pretty well, uh, I think, nails the, the coffin in the um, Darwinian view of how we're supposed to think of the origin of the species. But, yeah. uh, I mean, in other words, a bat never starts to code bear genes. I mean, that just doesn't happen. Uh, and that's known fact. There's no disputing that. And when you look at the way that the different uh, proponents of the theory try to explain that away when they look at things like viruses or supposedly viruses uh, or bacteria adapting, that's still, it's, there isn't, in other words, 
there's no new information in the code. It's only what's existing in that species with various, in a way, switches being turned on or off, right? So it's never, it's never that the bat starts to produce the bear genes to give it, you know, bear claws or something like this. Yeah, that that has never happened. The, the 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 precise way of saying this is basically that there's no new specified information. Right. So Shannon information, you can just get random code. And that's information. Specified information is information whose properties you can derive independently of just repeating the code, right? So um, an example of specified information would be a series of prime numbers. Now, if I tell you um, that I have written a series of prime numbers, um, you can write those out without me giving it the specific numbers. But if I just generate a sequence of random numbers, I cannot describe those to you other than just repeating it. And that's random information, that's non-specified information. The challenge is specified information. And this is the third level of evolution, or the third level of scientific um, controversy is Darwinism, which is that mutation, or neo-Darwinism rather, that uh, random mutation and uh, natural selection, the uh, differential survival of fitter organisms with respect to the environment, that that generates the complexity of life. And with respect to neo-Darwinism, um, the evidence is incredibly poor. I would go so far as to say there is virtually no evidence at all mm -hmm. that neo-Darwinism can do what is proposed. Right, especially when the more that we look at these things, we start to see how systems function holistically. So you don't get the development of an eye that's independent of the, uh, in the, the entity's uh, biology as a whole right yeah so yeah. the eye doesn't develop like independent from a brain or independent from you know the skull and the way that the skull fits the eyes uh, and once you start to see that holistic perspective it's it's even more difficult to try to salvage that view in, in my perspective another yeah. another thing i wanted to ask you too because sure. this is probably an area uh where we might have a little bit of disagreement and i'm not trying to spark a debate but sure. just out of curiosity are, are you do you know what chatham house is no. Okay. Uh, have you heard of the Lancet? No. Okay. So I was mentioning earlier this idea of the Royal Society, and uh, I'm not saying that the Royal Society literally can control uh, like every scientific mm, cadre out there in the world, but that there is a kind of hierarchy to the way academia works, and I know a little bit about this from being in you know higher academia and so forth, and moving in that world for a while. Uh, and then when you look at the history of education and the university system and so forth, and you start to see how it's run, you learn quite quickly, very quickly, that money is a big part of how grants, right, work yeah. to decide who gets what funding and who does what studies. And so if you don't get, if you don't produce certain results, then you're not going to get grants. Now, another aspect that's important I, I believe is understanding that modern science isn't really about what it says it is. It's not really about producing objective, testable results. Right mm -hmm. now, a lot of people do that. Right, they are there are plenty of scientists out there that are doing this. They're working within their fields to do this or that X Y Z. Um, but the problem is that in certain places, for example, MIT. MIT is very interested in creating technology and engineering that can be used for, I would argue, most of the time, pretty dark purposes because it's directly connected to the Pentagon and they have an interest in um, promoting a certain worldview, uh, particularly yeah. naturalism and so forth. Now, the reason I mentioned Chatham House is because that's one of the elite um, Royal Society connected groups that's very, very, very int intimately connected to uh, science uh, uh -huh. and global academia and the editor of the lancet the lancet is the oldest medical journal in the world kind of the most prestigious one he wrote a famous piece this last year where he talked about <clears throat> uh, fraud in science and it was kind of a stunning thing because as a scientist himself he said look we deal with the world's scientific journals you know we, yeah. we deal with this and he said, I can tell you that probably 50% of these are fake. 
Yeah. Now that's a astounding claim, but this guy is at the top of the academic scientific pyramid saying this. So he, he has no, no, he doesn't, there's nothing he gains from uh, quote conspiracy theory. I, I think he's absolutely true. Now take another example, Huxley. When Huxley wrote Brave New World, I don't believe that he was writing pure fiction. I believe he was saying that's the view that his perspective, uh, his crew, his cadre, that's where they wanted to take things, right? And there's a great discussion that he ha- that he uh, places within the novel between the socialist dictator, Mustafa Mond, uh, and the other characters who are questioning him about his control, and they have a lengthy dialogue about science. And Mustafa Mond says, do you realize that there is no real science that we put out? We put out what we want you to believe, namely naturalistic, reductionistic materialism. And he says, anytime that science begins to discover what might question that dogma, he says, we trash it. We get rid of it. Yeah. Now, we may not be at that total level of control, but what I want to, the reason I'm rambling about this is that it's very crucial to understand the distinction between what's called operation science and what's called origin science, right? So origin science would be what we're talking about, like the idea of, well, how did we come to be? What was going on, you know, back X, Y, Z, A on ago? That's very different from engineering science, right? And so engineering science is more hardball, you know, rubber hits the road stuff, dealing with building cars and bridges and rockets and so forth. Yeah. And I would, I believe that a lot more real science goes on in that field, in operation science, engineering, than goes on in these ideas of concocting narratives of what happened aeons ago. Now, I'm not saying that you can't do that. I'm just saying that it's a lot more speculative because it's not hands-on. I mean, I mean, the thing with historical science versus operation science, the first thing I, I want to say about that is that most people have heard that only from Ken Ham, who I don't like at all, um, but actually that is a distinction that's... Well, it's um, true. Oh, it's true, and it's very seriously discussed by philosophers of science. Uh, Stephen Meyer, who was taught at Cambridge, mm-hmm. uh, it's a philosopher of science, and he talks a lot in his book, Signature of the Cell, about uh, historical science. And it is, it's not that it's not real science, right. it's it's a lot more imprecise, it's a lot harder to uh, to make inferences in historical science, uh, and, and, and that's why bigger mistakes tend to be made there than just when you're smashing particles together. Mm-hmm. Right, but, you know... <laughs> I, 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 after, and I, and I did a lot with philosophy of science, um, in grad and undergrad, and it's one of my favorite subjects. And I take the view though, that we, it, our, our presuppositions really function like a template by which we read things. And you can yeah. be, you can have incorrect presuppositions and still do good science. Like you might, you know, really figure out some cool stuff about an earthworm, but incorrectly believe that you know the earthworm is like a billion years old or something it might be yeah yeah i mean the 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 way i like to talk about um christian presuppositions and taking the bible seriously uh is that you know the world is a puzzle you know solomon said it's the glory of god to conceal a matter the glory of kings to search it out the world is a puzzle and god delights when we search it out um in scripture and in genesis 1 to 11 god has essentially given us the corner pieces of the puzzle, mm-hmm. um, and we, if we take those corner pieces seriously, um, we will make scientific progress a lot more accurately. All right, you've been listening to Jay's analysis, and if you enjoy the first hour, be sure and go and check out Cabane Fifty Two. That's K A B A N E Five Two dot Tumblr dot com, where you can find uh, most of Tommy's works. There, he's also written some pieces that have gone into Pravoslavi uh, and other sites, I'm sure as well. Any other uh, places that you want to promote? Yeah, there's a, a blog on ancient faith called On Behalf of All, mm-hmm. uh, and I've, I've written uh, some, some pieces there as well. Okay, cool. And uh, if you listen to this and you like what you hear, be sure and subscribe to Jay's Analysis for Hour 2. You can subscribe for four ninety five a month or $60 a year. Also, check out my book that is forthcoming, Esoteric Hollywood, Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film. It's not a scandal book. It's a book about interpreting signs and symbols in film so if you like what we're talking about this kind of relates to that in uh, relation to hollywood so thank you for listening